me or did Derek put a little Nashville in Anton just now? That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Let's, let's bow and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, often we take it for granted, but your word tells us that it's living and active, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword, and it's able to pierce our thoughts, our intentions, and our very heart. And we need that. So we're asking you to speak to us this morning. We pray in your name. Amen. You saw there in the little trailer that uh, today we begin a new series, six weeks on the Old Testament book of Ruth. I'm going to guess that um, this is, may not be uh, something that you've studied much of in the past. And can we turn the lights up just a tad? I don't like to think I'm alone in here. Hey, hi. Hi. <laughs> it is a great, grand love story, uh, far better than any Hallmark movie. And I know some of you are into Hallmark movies. My wife is into Hallmark movies. But this is better that love comes softly, love comes tenderly, love comes quickly, love comes slowly, love comes, I don't know, whatever. There's a bajillion of those movies. Ruth is way better. It's a story that takes place within a grand epic tale of God's mercy and love. It's a story full of suffering and pain, grace, and ultimate redemption. It's only one of two books in the entire Bible named after a woman. The other one is, anybody know? Esther, that's correct. And it's the only book in all of the Bible that's about a non-Jew by title. Ruth is not a Jewish person. We'll, find, we'll see about that. According to the Talmud, Jewish tradition that is, the prophet Samuel wrote the book of Ruth, but the text says nothing about the author and really don't know for sure who wrote the book. Whoever it was, was a master storyteller. There are many things in Hebrew that are missed in English, and we'll try to point those out as we go. Goethe called Ruth the most beautiful story ever written. You might be tempted, if you've never read it before, to skip ahead to the end. I don't know if you're that kind of person who you read the last just to see how things resolve. Don't do that. Stay with us. Let the story unfold as it goes. The events of Ruth take place between 1200 and 1100 BC, so it's a very ancient book. Those of you who might be new to the Old Testament and, and putting it in its context, let me just give you kind of a, a quick flyby of where we are in the story of the Old Testament and God's people. The first five books of the Bible tell the story of God creating the earth and all that exists and how he established a people for himself. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we call that the Pentateuch, first five. He calls Abram, who becomes Abraham, the father of many nations, to, be, to, to follow him, to trust him, and leave Ur of the Chaldeans and, be, and follow him to a land he does not know. That's in Genesis 12. Abraham, in his old age, is blessed with a son, Isaac. Isaac has, 12, has a son, Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons. Maybe you saw Joseph in the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Remember that song, Jacob and Sons? His 12 sons become, anybody know? The 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. Jacob has his name changed to Israel. That's where the word means wrestles with God, struggles with God. There's a lot of struggle that goes on in Ruth. Those 12 sons of Jacob become the 12 tribes of Israel. You'll see a map here of the 12 tribes when they settle in the land. So the first five books tell the story of the, of the patriarchs and the con exodus and conquest. God establishing a people through one man. The, his, that, his descendants becoming the 12 tribes taking possession of the land that he promises them. So a specific people and a specific place are crucial to the story of the Old Testament. It also tells the story of God leading them out of slavery in Egypt when they settle in this land. You see below the tribe of Reuben there, it says Moab and Edom. Those are not Jewish Israelite nations. Those are Gentile pagan nations. Moab's going to be important in this story. We'll come back to that. The Israelites end up as slaves in Egypt. The Exodus tells the story of God delivering them out of slavery, wandering 40 years in the wilderness. And Deuteronomy ends with the nation of Israel, all those tribes, on the brink of entering in and taking possession that you see there. And the book of Joshua tells the story of conquest, how they enter in and settle and divide up the land. God is establishing his people in a particular place. All right, Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We're going to go kind of slow here through chapter 1 this morning and point out some things along the way. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to the sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife had two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Eph Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. Okay, just a couple of verses. There's a lot of details to unpack. 
uh, to make sense of the story. The whole scene is set right here. In the days when the judges ruled. Did you catch that? When are those days? So Joshua is the story of conquest entering into the land. The next book after Joshua is the Old Testament book of Judges. Judges tells a different story. They're in the land, and you think that they settle in, obey God, and he blesses them. That's not how the story goes. They settle in, forget God, rebel against God, and things get bad. The people then cry out to God because things have gotten bad. God hears their cry and sends what we call a judge or a deliverer to set things right. And then it's good for a while, and then what happens? Things go bad again because they forget God, reject God, rebel against God, and things get really, they get oppressed by other nations, and then they cry out to God, and what happens? God hears them, sends a judge to deliver them, and then they figure it out, and they get with the program and they obey. No. Does this sound like your life at all? Uh 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 Right? This is the cycle of judges. In this time, Ruth, and we don't know when in this time, but in this cycle of disobedience and oppression, crying out to God, deliverance, disobedience, oppression, crying out, deliverance, this cycle, this is when Ruth takes place. So we're getting like a little snapshot of one family from one village in one tribe in the midst of this tumultuous time in the history of God's people. Judges, Judges 21, verse 25, the last book, last verse of the book of Judges reads like this. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's like a summary statement for this, the period of Judges. And you could, it's actually kind of a summary statement for our own cultural moment, isn't it? Everyone does what's right in their own eyes, as they see fit. And it's not good for them or for the culture. And so we get a little snapshot here of, of this family. Bethlehem, by the way, you know, anybody know what the word Bethlehem means? Bet means house in Hebrew. Lechem means bread. House of bread is what Bethlehem means. Jesus was born in the house of bread, and he calls himself the bread of life. There is a famine in the land, so literally there's no bread in the house of bread. And they leave. Israel, the promised land. Remember, the whole story of God's people is someday he's going to deliver us out of slavery. Someday he's going to establish us in the land. Someday we're going to be where God wants us to be. And that day has come. They're in the promised land. But life gets hard. And so this man, Elimelech, takes his family and says, we're leaving. Leaving where he knows God wants him to be because life is hard. Elimelech's name means God is king. In a time when Israel had no king, there's a lot of play on words happening here in this story. He leaves the promised land and takes his wife and sons to Moab. Moab is not a good place. Las Vegas has nothing on Moab. If you like going to Las Vegas, well, that's your deal. But Moab is Sin City, really. It's known for its sin, corruption, idolatry. The origin of the, origins of the Moabites take place in Genesis 19. It's very graphic. I won't go into detail, but basically the Moabites come from Lot having incestuous relationships with his two daughters. That's the history of the Moabites. There's a lot of animosity and tension between the Israelites and the Moabites throughout their history. Moabite women were viewed as uh, temptresses who led away Israelite men into sexual immorality and into idolatry. The, to go to Moab was like the, the worst place you could go if you were a faithful Israelite. You don't go to Moab. Nobody goes to Moab. Why would you go to Moab? Those are the enemies of God. That's a dark place. How bad must things be in Bethlehem to think that Moab is better? Let me just pause for a minute. Have any of you ever left what you believed God wanted for you and pursued something else or someone else because it was difficult? Have you ever thought, I know this is what God wants, and then life got really hard, and you thought, I must have been wrong. Clearly, God wouldn't want me to struggle like this. Clearly, God wouldn't want me to, and you bailed. And you look back, and you think, what was I thinking? A good friend of mine had a very successful job, traveled a ton, young kids, and just felt like, I I feel like God is saying that i got to give this up. I don't need, his words to me were, I make more money than anybody my age should. That's what he said to me when we got together. I'm like, oh, okay, tell me about that. <laughs> but then he said, I, I, I got to give this up because it's too high a price for my family. I'm convinced 
I prayed with him about it. I'm convinced of what God wants. And he did. Three months into his new job, making a fraction of what he made, saying he's happy, the corporate recruiter came knocking. And he couldn't resist. And he went right back. How often do we think, oh, I, God wants this for me. And then life gets hard. We think, well, maybe not. Maybe it's better over there. That's what happens here for Limelech and his family. It's so easy to assume that if where God wants us to be, then life should be easier, or at least not as painful. We shouldn't struggle. But that's not a promise you find anywhere in the Bible. It's a promise some people falsely proclaim, that if you, if you follow God, you're, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and it's all going to go well for you. That's nothing we find in the Scriptures, a promise that your life will be easy if you always do what God says. Now, the next few verses tell a very tragic story in a series of brutal, cold, hard facts. There's not many details given. It's just really stark. Let's read Ruth 1, 3 through 5. Brace yourselves. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. Think about that. The name of one was Orpah, the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband, period. It's easy to, to skip over this. This is, this is ten, a 10-year ten nightmare described in three verses. We moved to Moab thinking life's going to be better because it's hard in Bethlehem. My husband dies. My sons marry Moabite women. Remember what the Old Testament view of Moabite women was. Not what Naomi envisioned for her boys. And then her boys die. And she's got two daughter-in-laws, and that's it, in a foreign land. Just one tragedy after another. This is not at all how Naomi imagined her life turning out. Life in Moab. Desperation, devastation, and despair. Moab becomes kind of a metaphor for life apart from God. Not to say that if you, did, if you would have stayed in Israel, nothing bad would have happened. But the last verse, she is left without her two sons and her husband. Alone. It's not to say that God's people are protected from any calamity or tragedy if they stay inside of his will. What it means is you'll never be alone. We think God is far from us when bad things happen. The temptation for you and for me is when life is hard to think, where are you, God? Where have you gone? When very often, it's not God who's moved. We have. We've moved. We find ourselves in a distant country thinking, how did I get here? How did it get like this? <coughs> Let me read on, Ruth uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 13. Listen closely, because again, the author gives little hints of things in very few verses. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you wait, therefore, till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. It is extremely bitter for me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. This is, this is really, can you hear like the, if this was an epic tale, this is a very, the, the sad music is playing. This is a profound thing that Naomi is saying here. This is more than a nice goodbye, God bless, I'm going back. She's, she's doing something. She's made the decision to return to her own people. And she's saying to the only people that she has left in the world, go back. So they're partway gone. 
They've, they're part way. They've followed her at least part of the way. We don't know how far. But she's saying, go back. Because you've got no future with me. I am a childless widow past the age of marrying. Don't hitch your wagon to me. There's nothing for you. Your only hope for any kind of a future is you're still fairly young. Go back to Moab. Find other men. Marry, have children. You see, in our culture, your identity and your future and your sense of security, significance, is based on your resume, even if you don't have an actual resume. Your accomplishments, right? The things that you do, how much you make, where you went to school, what you achieve. But in the ancient world, your resume was your genealogy. Where you come from and who's coming after you. Your family line. And Naomi's saying, there isn't one with me. This is a sinking ship, in other words. I'm going back with nothing, and you're going to be Moabite women in Israel. That's not going to go well. Go back home. Naomi is sacrificing her present security and comfort and companionship for their future good. It's a profound sacrifice. She's, she has nobody. Nobody. All she has is two daughters-in-law. And she says, I'm going to give that up for your sake. Notice in verse 8 and 9, Naomi asks, put that back up if we can. Go back to verse 8 and 9. I know that's a challenge. I have to keep our slide up right on its toes. You never know what I might say. Um, actually, we, we have, we have uh, one, one more slide there. We have mistyped uh, this. Um, in your Bible, you'll, it says, the Lord grant that you may. It should be L-O-R-D in all caps. We have mistyped that. Um, when it says L-O-R-D in all caps in the Old Testament, anytime you see in the Old Testament, L-O-R-D in all capital letters, that's a specific reference to the sacred name of God, Yahweh. Meaning it's the this personal name of God. So Naomi asks that the Lord, Yahweh, bless Orpah. And by the way, this is a little funny aside. Do you know where Oprah got her name? Her mom misspelled this name. So that's not part of the sermon, but it's interesting. <laughs> Naomi says to Orpah and Ruth, the Lord, Yahweh's hand is against her. It's very bitter because the Lord's hand has gone against me. She just asked that the Lord, Yahweh, would bless her daughter-in-laws. So she's saying, Yahweh's hand is against me, but I want Yahweh's hand to bless you. She's not saying God hates me and God caused all this or God killed my sons. That's not what she's saying. The Bible never says that. What she is saying is both hardship and blessing fall underneath the sovereignty of Yahweh, of the Lord. We get the blessing part. But many of us want to say, well, the hardships in my life, maybe God didn't know about that or couldn't do anything about that. I don't want a small God like that. We're going to see Ruth's faith and Naomi's faith develop in this way. This is so crucial. Both the blessing and suffering of life fall underneath the sovereignty of God. And there's a little hint of hope here. A hint of hope. It's easy to miss, but did you catch the reason Naomi's going back? Anybody catch it? Why did she decide to go back? Because she heard a rumor. I'm going to say she heard a rumor, and you guys all say, a rumor? Ready? She heard a rumor. A rumor. Yes, a rumor. <laughs> What's the rumor? That God has visited his people and has brought them food. It's, a, it's verse 6. Let me read it again. Verse 6. Ruth 1, 6. Then she arose her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she heard in the fields of Moab the Lord had visited his people and given them food. She heard a rumor that God, maybe God had not abandoned them. Maybe the famine wasn't a symbol of God's rejection or abandonment. Maybe he's still alive. Any of you read the Chronicles of Narnia? They make their way into a lot of sermons, I know, but there's a point to that. If you've ever read the Chronicles of Narnia, when the children are in, in, the, in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when they meet Mr. Beaver, don't you just want to be in Mr. and Mrs. Beaver's house? And what does Miss, Mr. Beaver say? He says this phrase that comes up over and over again in the story. He says, Aslan is what? On the move. Aslan is on the move. Let me read to you what Lewis writes, what happens to the children's minds and hearts when they hear that phrase, when they've never even heard of Aslan before. Aslan is on the move, they say, said Mr. Beaver. Perhaps he's already landed here in Narnia. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment Mr. Beaver spoke these words, everyone felt quite different. 
at the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump in, inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize it is the beginning of the holidays or of summer break. He's trying to say, like, just the name, just the hint that's, that God is on the move does something to you. I think that's what's happening to Naomi. What? The Lord has returned? He never left? I only hope I have this to go back. This is a theme, not only in the book of Ruth, but all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the Bible. In moments of darkness and despair and brokenness and pain and loss, there are little hints that God is still on the move. They he's still working. And that's true today. I remember reading a, a novel called St. Brendan the Navigator. He's a uh, part historic, part mythic Celtic saint. Uh, and he, there's a line in there that stayed with me all these years. He'd said, never doubt in the darkness that what you believe in the light. What you're convinced of about, from God's word now in good times, don't cast aside when life is hard, when it gets dark. The entire first chapter of Ruth is like this. It's pretty dark and stark, but there are little hints of hope all throughout. They're easy to miss. You have to look for them. But so often, all we can see in those moments is just our despair, our hardship, our difficulty, our pain. And we miss little hints that God is saying, I haven't abandoned you. I'm not done. I'm still at work. Let me show you a map of Ruth's journey here. This is, the red line is about a 50-mile trek. So it's 50 miles on foot for a widow, childless widow, and two daughter-in-laws. We don't know exactly where they are, probably somewhere around the Arnor Arnon River when they decide to turn back, or at least Orpah does. And that's about 10 miles from the, from the country of Moab. It's mountainous, it's desert, it's, a, it's not an easy journey. Somewhere on this trek of 50 miles of a rugged desert and mountains, Ruth does something shocking. And the whole story is going to turn on what happens in the next few verses. We're calling this unexpected faithfulness. Unexpected faithfulness. One of the most emotional moments in the whole book of Ruth happens when Ruth refuses to leave her mother-in-law. Let me read to you verses 14 through 18. And if you uh, like to highlight, underline, or mark up your Bible, I would mark up these verses. This is the turning point of the story. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For, I go, for you, where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I'll be buried. May the Lord, it should be all caps there, that's Yahweh, may the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. This Orpah kisses and weeps, but then also says she's probably right. Orpah does what makes sense in the culture. Goes back. That's your only chance for a future. Back to your family, back to your parents, back to your siblings, back to your hometown. Start over. At least you'll, be, at least you'll have food and a place to stay. But Ruth clung to her. The Hebrew word for clung is debak. It's the same word used in Genesis 2.24. A man shall leave his father and mother and cling, cleave, hold on to his wife. It's like wedding vow language. Ruth gives a remarkable declaration of faithfulness and personal loyalty, doesn't she? She says, don't tell me to go back. I'm not leaving. I'm with you. All the way to the grave, she says. Sounds like wedding vows. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Uh, Your people be my people. Your God, my God. I'm going to be with you till death do us part. Clings to her. It's beautiful for a husband and wife. I've never heard, I've done a lot of weddings. I've never once heard in-law vows. Can you imagine? <laughs> Bride and groom, now turn to your in- father-in-law and say to him, where you go, <laughs> that'd be so weird. You know, I'm not talking, no, we're leaving you, right? What if I made a groom next time say, I want you to repeat these words to your mother-in-law, right? <laughs> Mother-in-laws would like it. This is a mother-in-law to a daughter-in-law. I'm not leaving. 
Don't ask me. I'm with you. And it's so profound that we're told that Ruth says, Naomi says nothing more about it. The rest of the journey, however many miles it was, they, they take it in silence. No more dialogue. No more talk. It's so profound. This is one of those moments when a single decision changes everything. This is the turning point that will change the life of Naomi and Ruth throughout the whole story. She's giving up her culture, her family, her religion, her future, and committing her life to a childless widow who's past marrying age, headed to a land where she will absolutely be an outsider looked down on. This is a shocking thing. It makes zero sense economically, socially, culturally. From any other perspective, what she's doing is crazy. It's crazy town. Why would you do this? She's going to be an immigrant in Israel. I didn't think about this until this, this week, reading this. She's going to be an immigrant. She's not an Israelite. Most immigrants, and we talk a lot about immigration these days in our country, with very little wisdom applied to it, most immigrants leave their country of origin. Why? So things will be worse? Who leaves their country of origin because I'm looking for hardship and suffering and I want to be looked down on? No, they leave, look, hoping, hoping, even though it's difficult, it will be better. But Ruth does the opposite. She knows it's not going to be better. Naomi has nobody. Her husband, sons are dead. She's going back when she's the one that walked out when things were hard. Now, what Ruth does just makes zero sense. So I'm going to ask the question, why would she do it? Here's Ruth's choice. This comes from Sinclair Ferguson's commentary on the book of Ruth. Ruth's choice comes down to this. Everything minus God in Moab or God plus nothing in Israel. Which would you choose? Substitute whatever you want for Moab and Israel, right? Do you, do you want God plus nothing else? I'm asking you really to consider this question for a minute. In your life, you say, I just, I mean, of course I have other desires and hopes and dreams, but when it comes down to it, all I really want, desperately want, is to know that God is with me. I want him plus nothing. But if I had the whole world and not him, it wouldn't be worth it. Now in church, you go, oh yeah, yeah, I believe that, Pastor. But when we leave here, do you you live that way? I don't always. I live as if I want God, but, you know, I also want all the things that he might give me. It's a stark choice she's making. And she's not an Israelite. Now I want to point something out to you as we go, you'll see this as we go through Ruth. Nothing in the entire book of Ruth is miraculous. There's not one resurrection story, miraculous healing story, divine vision, divine dream. The Old Testament and New Testament are full of those. But in the book of Ruth, it's all just ordinary hard life. So where would Ruth get this faith to say, I'm attaching myself to you and to your God? Where would that come from? Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, faith is the assurance of things we hope for and the conviction of things not seen. She's not seen it. Where does she get this faith? I'm speculating here, but I'm going to suggest she gets it from Naomi. She gets it from Naomi. This is the power of a faithful friend. The relationship between Ruth and Naomi will turn out to be a blessing from God in both directions. We're going to see that as we go. But just don't you, don't you long for a friend to whom you could say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm with you. No matter what comes, you can count on me. Don't you long to have a friend say to you, I'm not going anywhere. I'm with you. No matter what comes, you can count on me. Don't you want someone in your life that you feel that way about and that feels that way about you? That's what's happening here with Ruth and Naomi. And I don't think this happens without the pain they've been through, the power of a shared ordeal. When I played college sports, you know, we'd talk about, we'd have these workouts we'd want to do, to get, do together. Nobody wanted to do them, but 6 a.m. workouts, why? Suffering together does something to your bond. I don't want to overplay sports, but I'm saying it's true, isn't it? In athletics and in life, suffering together strengthens a bond. 
I don't think Naomi, Ruth makes this commitment to Naomi if they haven't been through such an ordeal together. She's seen something in her. Proverbs 17, verse 7, that says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother or sister is born for adversity. It's playing out here in the life of Ruth and Naomi. Okay, let's read the last part of chapter 1. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. It's a ton of, there's a ton in here. The whole town is stirred when they show up. Small town, everybody knows everybody's business in a small village, right? Anybody here grew up in a small town? Everybody knows what's going on. They come back. She went away, married woman, two sons, full. She comes back, one non-Jewish daughter-in-law. Nothing, empty. How would that feel? She's like, I came back empty if you're, if you're Ruth. All right. Guess I'm less than nothing. And, and, and there was a lot of shame, I'm sure, heaped on Naomi and fear for Ruth to come back to Bethlehem in this way. Naomi's name means sweet, pleasant. She says, don't call me that. Call me Mara. It means bitter. Again, she's not saying God did all this. She's saying it's happened. She calls him the Almighty. That's the Hebrew word El Shaddai. And then she also calls him Lord, a personal name God, Yahweh. I think you could say El Shaddai is God's power and Yahweh is God's presence. He's great, El Shaddai, and he's good, Yahweh. Do you struggle to hold together God's greatness and his goodness? When, 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 when your life gets really hard and you've had some real pain, do you struggle to believe that he's both great and good? I think it's a struggle of our lives. And I think one of the primary messages of Ruth is that, yes, God is both great and good, even in the midst of pain. In his sovereign design, God allows sorrowful tragedy to set the stage for his triumph of grace and redemption. I'm going to finish by reading you something from George MacDonald's book, uh, The Princess and the Goblin. George MacDonald, by the way, was one of C.S. Lewis' favorite authors. The, the, if you know the story, Irene the princess has a fairy godmother, grandmother, who's beautiful and wonderful and full of light and, and power and wisdom, and, and the, the goblins are sort of attacking the castle, and she tells her, when you're in trouble, when you're in danger, uh, she makes an invisible silver thread and says, follow this thread. You can only feel it, you can't see it. No matter what happens, follow the thread. But I can't see it, grandmother, she said. Feel, daughter, a little way down from the ring, because it's attached to her ring, toward the cabinet said the lady. Oh, I do feel it, exclaimed the princess, but I can't see it. No, the thread is too fine for you to see it. You can only feel it. Now listen, if you ever find yourself in any danger, such, for example, as you were in this evening, you must take off the ring, put it under the pillow of your bed, then you must lay your finger, the same that wore the ring, upon the thread and follow the thread wherever it leads. Oh, how delightful. It will lead me to you, grandmother, I know it. Yes, dear, but remember, it may seem to you a very roundabout way, and you must not doubt the thread. Of one thing you may be sure that while you hold it, I hold it too. And then the goblins attack, and she's under threat, and she, and she does just this. She puts the ring under her pillow, feels the thread, and the thread leads her down secret passages out of the castle. And then feeling with the forefinger of her right hand, soon found her grandmother's thread, which she proceeded at once to follow. Across the yard, the thre thread still ran along the ground until it brought her to a door in the wall, which opened upon the mountainside. Down, down the path went, then up, then down again, getting rugged and more rugged. As it went, along the path went the silvery thread. And still along the thread went Irene's little rosy-tipped finger. And still the path grew rougher and steeper, and the mountain grew wilder and wilder. But on went the thread, and on went the princess. Then she began to be frightened indeed. Every moment she kept feeling the thread backwards and forwards, and as she went farther and farther into the darkness of the great hollow of the mountain, she kept thinking more and more about her grandmother. 
and all that she had said to her and how kind she had been, how beautiful and wise she was. And she was convinced again. The thread could not have gone here by itself. Her grandmother must be holding it. But presently, she came to a huge heap of stones piled in a slope against the wall of the cavern. On these she climbed and soon recovered the level of the thread, only, however, to find the next moment it vanished into a stone wall and left her standing on it to face solid rock. For one terrible moment, she thought, my grandmother has forsaken me. She threw herself upon the heap and began to cry. And then she thought, well, I could follow the thread backwards and thus got off the, get off the mountain and then home. She rose at once and found the thread, but the instant she tried to feel it backwards, it vanished from her touch. Forwards it led her hand up to the heap of stones, backward it seemed to go nowhere. Neither could she see it as before, the light of the fire. She burst into a wailing cry and threw herself down on the stones. And the story goes on that she can only follow the thread going forward. You can never go back, you can only go forward, trusting that grandmother holds it. And it leads her to a secret passage, and it does lead her through many adventures and, and terrifying moments, but eventually safe. McDonald is giving us in this fantasy story a beautiful picture of discipleship. Follow the thread. You want to know how you can trust that God is good and great at the same time? Follow the thread. The temptation is to say, God has abandoned me, God has rejected me, God is not here, and let go when you're in darkness and pain. The story of Ruth and the whole Bible is saying, you must follow the thread because you know the one who holds it on the other end. And we're going to see what he does to those who hold the thread and follow it to the very end. Let's bow in prayer. Father God, this ancient story is so relevant for us because many of us feel like Naomi and Ruth felt. Like how much more, God? How much more can we take? And where are you in the midst of my suffering? And we pray that your spirit would remind us as we go from this place that you have not abandoned us. That in your sovereignty, though we don't understand it always, you allow for suffering and pain and loss in order to show us your goodness and mercy if we will follow the thread of your grace. Give us the strength to do that. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.